Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is the second webinar in our Stand with Kashmir series um, that we are producing in partnership with Stand with Kashmir. My name is Uma and I am the Executive Director of Women's March Global. Um, Today, I am really excited to be able to host uh, Fazel and Junaid. Um, we are going to have a very in-depth discussion and I wanna just go over a little bit how the webinar is going to work. For all of those who are attending, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you will see on the bottom of your Zoom screen, if you're not uh, familiar with Zoom, a little box that says Q&A. And you can type in at any time any questions that you have or even any comments. I will see them during the course of the discussion and we will leave a little bit of time for your questions and or to address your comments. I would like to remind everybody to be civil in your comments and your suggestions the, the, and your questions. The topic that we are talking about is not an easy one, but at the same time, we must be respectful in this space. And so please um, abide by those principles. Um, before we begin into this topic, I would like to have Junaid and uh, Fazel just introduce themselves. So if you, Junaid, if you can start first and introduce yourself, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Uma, uh, Uma, so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mohammed Junaid. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Um, I am a Kashmiri. I've written on Kashmir for years now. I've done extensive research on Kashmir. Uh, and my primary uh, focus on research has been military occupation in Kashmir and uh, the history of the Tariq movement. Great, thank you so much. Um, if you can introduce yourself, sorry, Mohammed. Oh, were you not able to see, hear me? No, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Um, so my name is Mohammed Junad. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Uh, I am a Kashmiri and my research has been on Kashmir for, I have spent years researching Kashmir. My focus has been uh, military occupation and the history of the Tariq movement in Kashmir. Great, thank you so much. And then Faisal, if you can introduce yourself, please. My name is Faisal, and uh, I'm I'm a child I'm a child of Tehreek, as uh, Junaid pointed out. I was born in the 90s. I started blogging when I was 13, and then I became a journalist. Uh, currently, I'm working in Istanbul, and I'm also a student doing my masters in international relations. Great, thank you so much. Um, the topic of this webinar is quite a serious one, um, how to survive in the world's most militarized zone and the daily life under occup occupation. Um, currently, um, you know, one could say that Kashmir is now uh, under its 59th day of occupation, but it's also been 30 years of occupation. Um, Junaid, I would like for you, if you, if you can, to just give a brief overview of the very <laughs> brief, because it's, 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 um, not brief, but the brief overview of the very complex history when we're talking about occupation for those who have absolutely no idea what's even happening in, in Kashmir, just to paint a picture there. Um, yes, I think uh, the most important thing is that despite the fact that a lot of people know about uh, what has been happening in Kashmir, it's the question of how to frame this history. Um, that I'm interested in. Uh, my work has primarily been about how Kashmiris understand their own past. Uh, so I'll uh, begin with 1931 when Kashmiris rose for the first time uh, demanding uh, equality, justice, democratic rights uh, from the pre-1947 Dogra regime. Their demand has all was that uh, they are equal like every other uh, community in Kashmir and they should be given equal rights. In 1947, um, there's possibility, there was a possibility of freedom and independence for Kashmir, but uh, the partition of South Asia and the hasty retreat of the British from the subcontinent meant that Kashmir became engulfed in a, um, kind of like an imperial contest be um, between India and Pakistan, uh, where India sent its troops which Kashmiris see as uh, an invasion 
uh, and the beginning of the occupation of Kashmir. Um, this process uh, continued till 1987 when uh, like the, you know, Kashmiris grew tired of uh, the, an election system which basically did not represent Kashmiris well, which basically meant that uh, local uh, collaborators who Kashmiris call collaborators, collaborators st had started to represent Indian interests in Kashmir rather than uh, representing Indian Kashmiri interests. And so, which led to uh, the mass uprising for independence in, uh, in late 1989, early 1990. In response to which, India sent uh, close to 350,000 soldiers, um, adding on to the already existi existing 250,000 soldiers that were present in the region, giving them um, powers like Armed Force Special Powers Act, which gave Indian soldiers immunity from civil prosecution for human rights abuses. And they use these uh, you know, privileges to the fullest. Uh, and this process continued uh, continues into the present. And in the process, um, India has used uh, the rhetoric of Islamic terrorism, of uh, counterinsurgency war, uh, to inflict um, a huge number of deaths and um, you know, destruction in Kashmir. Close to 90,000 90, people have been killed in this uh, in, you know, incessant war since then. Thousands are disappeared. Many of them probably are uh, ended up in mass graves that were discovered along the line of control. Uh, and there are uh, reports of um, rapes um, of uh, you know abuses against women that um, have been reported uh, by human rights activists in Kashmir, but do not get much you know media attention. So yeah, it's a long, complex history, but also a simple history. You know, one could one could think of this as a continuation of a process that started in 1947, and uh, it, it's you know continuous uh, intensification. I, um... I want to just uh, go back to something that you just said, um, which is that one could see this as a long, complex process, but it's, it's simple as well. And yet to outsiders, for those who have no his idea of the history between India and Kashmir, it just seems like the past 59 days, right? Like, like you know, the article was revoked and then the occupation happened, where in reality, this occupation has been going on for, for quite some time. Um, can you just dive into the complex but simple narrative? Because on one hand, in, a, in the last webinar, we talked about how India is able to really paint this as some, you know, as, as, a, as an issue, as you brought up in terms of Islamophobia and, and um, you know, Islamic extremism. Can you dive into that just a little bit, please? Um, yes, the, the story that India likes to tell the interna international community is that Kashmiris cannot be given freedom because they are Muslims. I mean, and this started way back in 1947 when um, local rebels, local Kashmiri rebels uh, were demanding freedom. They took up arms against uh, this oppressive Dogra regime. And the Indian narrative was that it was the um, Islamists who were trying to take over Kashmir. I mean, the fact is that Kashmir is a Muslim majority region. Most people practice their religion, just like Hindus practice their religion and other communities practice their own religion. And, uh, but when Kash the Kashmiri Muslims demand their rights, uh, these rights are couched as if they are like some kind of like uh, demands for superior rights. All they're demanding is equality. They're, saying, they're not saying that we want freedom because we're special. They're saying that we want freedom because we're just like everybody else. And so Indian government has used uh, this fact of Kashmiris being majority Muslim as a way to discredit them. And of course, it um, uh, fits into this larger global narrative of Islamophobia, which got intensified in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, when Modi came to... Um, to the United Nations General Assembly, um, the, the coded language that he used was of Islamic extremism and terrorism, which, by which he meant that any demands for equality or rights that Muslim Kashmiris are demanding um, should be simply seen in this binary of um, you know, Islam versus the rest. 
And so he's building kind of like this in international solidarity um, against uh, any Muslim in, in South Asia, be those uh, Muslims um, in Assam, be those Muslim, Muslim minorities in India, be that Pakistan, which also gets kind of coded in that framework. And of course, Kashmiris as like somehow, um, uh, you know, being aggressive, being like in their demands. I think this is a really, really good point to bring up how the language that Modi uses really is further marginalizing um, Kashmiris and Muslims. Um, you know, because this is not just a, an attack on Muslims in Kashmir, this is an attack on Muslims in India, in Assam, in so many different places within India that, that Modi is doing. But so I want to turn to you, um, you know, the, the, the topic of this webinar is, is daily life under occupation. Can you paint a picture and, you know, so many of us that are listening to this webinar, that will listen to this webinar, you know, even for myself, we don't have the experience at all as to what daily life under occupation looks like. Can you um, describe what that can be like or is like for Kashmiris right now? And all of the knock-on effects, all of the impacts that that occupation has, not only just on education, but on business, um, you know, on families, and go from there. You know, uh, to contemporize Charles Dickens, these are the best of times and these are the worst of times. So occupation, like living under occupation, when you see it from the outside, it's like, how did I survive this? And when you're there, it's like you kind of normalize it because if you don't normalize it, you, your survival instincts won't kick in. That survival mode that has been there since generations. So um, it's, I think if, uh, for, for me, as a Kashmiri who was born and who grew up there, uh, if there was no conflict and there was no occupation, I don't think I would be the person I am today because occupation has shaped mine and a lot of other people who are from my generation, their identity. Even from Junaid's generation, I don't think he's that older than me, but uh, also his, uh, his peers as well. Uh, you know, um, I had written this a long time back when I started blogging that I was born in a conflict. I was born in a curfew in a snowstorm. I tried to play football. I tried, uh, I tried to play football, but I got caught in barbed wires and tried to run, run for medals, but I had to run for my life. So it, it was kind of uh, an idea like when we used to play cricket on these, in, in these large cricket op open fields, which were being invaded by this martyr's graveyard slowly and slowly in Idga, where we used to go and play cricket. Uh, or in these uh, by lanes and by lanes of downtown Srinagar, where I grew up, uh, we used to play cricket or play football or whatever games we used. And then there used to be this sudden scream, the military is coming. And then this survival mode would kick in and we would just jump over like 10 feet walls. And even like being a eight year old, you were trained to like, okay, this is the way you step on this wall and this is the way you push yourself and you go on. And how do you jump? So these were techniques that we kind of learned ourselves and the environment around this condition does. Uh, we could tell how a military would respond by their way of walking and how, by the way of their running. So like I grew up next to a military camp. And I remember when I was little, uh, these balls would go inside that camp and they would never return it. And I remember I had promised myself that one day when this camp will go, I'll play, I'll play cricket inside it. So luckily it happened before the occupation in, in the entire Kashmir ended. It was two years ago after four months of long curfew, we had no internet. So I used to survive by playing volleyball and football and cricket with these kids in my neighborhood. And I, so the military suddenly one fine day said uh, we would leave because the occupation is so entrenched in, in, in Srinagar that you don't need physical spaces to, uh, to make the occupation visible by these bunkers and military camps. So because they have these huge cantonments in, around Srinagar where they can instantly reach any part of Srinagar in five, 10 minutes. So they left one fine day, the structures was, was, was practically in ruins. So they had demolished the wall so I went inside, I called all the kids in my neighborhood, said, let's go and play cricket. 
So when I held my bat, I remember that promise I had made to my like eight-year-old self that when this will go, I'll start playing cricket. So I went there, I held my bat, and I played. And that was the best moment in my life. It, it was the closest that I have been to feel that freedom uh, in, in my heart, in my soul. And I cherish that moment. And incidentally, I have it, I record it on phone. If uh, I grow up, like, older because Kashmiris tend to have really low lifespans. I hope not. Uh, I, I hope we get to see the day we, our ancestors and we envision. I'll show it to my, my friends, my kids, the next generation that this is what I did when that moment happened and that, that's when I realized that it is possible. That's so incredibly powerful, um, Faisal, and I think what people need to recognize and understand is that Kashmiris and young Kashmiris now, they do not know a life without occupation. The, the society that they but, have... But mm -hmm. they don't know a life without occupation, but they live the, the, a life without occupation in their dreams and hopes. Yes. I don't think there's a single Kashmiri who I know who does not envision a life without occupation. Mm -hmm. it's, our, it's, it's our only purpose in life is to live free. Uh, when I... If, if, like, when I told myself that I have to leave Kashmir. Even when I'm here, I, I keep thinking of, of it. There's this fam uh, Kashmiri American poet who is basically our poet of liberation. He says, each night put Kashmir in your dreams and that's what we all do. Mm -hmm. So we have seen how it feels like. We have seen it on our dreams and hopes. And it's there. We know how, it, how it's going to be. Uh, but it's not there yet. You know? we're, we're working towards that. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea. Can you speak towards, Faisal, as a follow-up question, um, the impunity, the absolute lack of accountability that the um, Indian military has in what they do in Kashmir? Um, I, I have a lot of stories because I, I, like I, I want to be a storyteller. That's my goal. So I remember this uh, time in school, a military crackdown happened and they took our principal they basically took him to prison maybe for extortion and something like that and i pointed a finger to to the military and this guy in my school i don't remember his name he told me never point a finger towards a military person and that was in 1997 i was really little until 2008 when we had the mass uprising and never dared to put a finger point towards a military personnel that's how intrinsic the fear the culture of impunity is it's not like they kill you and uh, you can't do anything. It's that whole environment that is conditioned to tell you that no matter what you do, it's all, it's basically, uh, the occupation makes you very fatalistic. It makes you think that everything that you do is not worth it because they have all the power and they can do whatever they want to do and they can get away with it. They can just walk in your house and decor and tell you to uh, basically um, leave. And then you can't do anything because they have the power, because the power is in their hands with guns. The power is in their hands with law. The power is in the hand of a state that backs them. The power is in, in their inherent colonization of a plan. The power is in, of the, their power lies in our disenfranchisement and disenfranchisement of us as a human being. Uh, it is in, in, in their media, which continues to portray us as the, uh, and the but continues to portray us as de uh, demons and dehumanize us on a daily basis. So all those constructs that uh, there is, they, it, it, uh, they derive that power. Occupation derives that power from that. And Kashmiris are not just fighting an army, they're just fighting an entire state, not just the state, but it's also structures that are so deeply entrenched in our society. It's probably the world's most dirtiest and most entrenched occupation in, in its history. I mean, you have 60 days of a siege and they say everything is normal because they have normalized it for the last 30 years now. Like, as Agha Shah Adeli says, they make a desolation and call it peace. And that's what peace is for them. Um, I want to ask you both another round of questions, but then also remind everybody we have a question that's come through that I'll ask at the end. But if you do have questions, um, please type them in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end. Um, Junaid, you've done research on um, militarization and I would, 
I want to ask you, with your research in mind, um, how has it shaped Kash Kashmiri political subjectives um, from your findings? Um, well, as you can hear from Faisal's uh, anecdote as well, um, uh, a lot of us, a lot of younger people um, who have not seen any, any normal except uh, the abnormality of the occupation, um, we have grown up with dreaming that there, there, there is light at the end of the day, that we believe in a future uh, of uh, freedom and freedom from occupation. Um, and most Kashmiris interact with uh, themselves, who they are and what Kashmir is in primarily two ways. One is um, their, through their everyday interactions with the state, which are of course undergirded by violence. Uh, like you cannot, uh, the state in Kashmir is a repressive state. State uh, in Kashmir is the state that wants to control you, control your voice. It wants to uh, turn your body into like an object that it can inflict pain upon. Um, so every interaction, be that on the street, be that on, in the school, be that in your own home, uh, is laden with fear, is laden with anxiety. So um, that's one way in which uh, Kashmiris uh, have internalized uh, an understanding of state as necessarily uh, um, an enemy. Uh, and which is, of course, borne by facts, because that's how most Kashmiris uh, interact with the state. Second, um, they look at their own history. They try to find themselves, um, try, to, try to understand uh, where are they placed in relationship to other societies? Uh, how, how do they see themselves in relationship to their previous generations? Um, I mean... I told you at the beginning that the framing is important. Um, and this framing is not simply a political convenience. Uh, this, the, the framing is the Kashmiri framing that the Kashmiris understand um, their history as a history of suffering, um, as a history where one foreign ruler after another foreign ruler has come and taken away uh, our, you know, you know, our freedoms. And so, um, in a way, you could say that the political subjectivity of Kashmiris is shaped by these uh, violent interactions with the state and their own um, desire to locate them, themselves in the history of struggle and resistance. And Kashmiris primarily see themselves as a population that is resisting. Um, that is, I mean, um, Kashmiris do not see themselves as ever dominating anyone uh, or they see themselves as like one among uh, this larger group of communities around the world, nations around the world, who are facing similar uh, questions, the Palestinians, uh, you know, uh, people in other places where uh, similar occupations are, are taking place. As a follow-up to, to what you've just said, I mean, this, this you said, and I'm, I'm just remembering this off the cuff, you said that Kashmiris do not see themselves as ever uh being in power over anybody else you know and that that this daily life under occupation um is something that becomes embedded within the narrative i'm, I'm paraphrasing here and you also brought up the palestinian context as well this this everyday living under this occupation i mean is is, is changing has changed almost the dna of Kashmiris that are living in the valley. And, and when we're talking about the, the subjectivity, um, it's, I don't know, I, I find myself struggling with the understanding of how deep occupation really is embedded within Kashmiris, you know, on a day-to-day -day level. Um, and I say this as an as a Indian Brahmin that is very aware of the Hindu right wing, Hindu nationalism, and everything that has done up until this point. Um, so I guess I'm having an existential crisis in, in formulating this follow-up question to you. But can, can you expand up, up on that a little bit more? Well, I think that um, every 
society has some kind of a moral understanding of themselves. You know, there's a, a moral center, um, how they imagine themselves. I mean, it, um, it could be true of every society that they imagine that they are not oppressing anyone. But in the case of Kashmiris, uh, they, they believe, they strongly believe that they have never been in a position of power over others. That even um, in cases when uh, there have been other minorities, even those minorities have uh, typically been a, in a position of power over the Kashmiri, uh, the larger Kashmiri Muslims. Um, and which makes most Kashmiris ask, uh, why is it happening to us? Um, you know, when we have not, we don't deserve to be occupied. Uh, I mean, uh, occupation is not something external to Kashmir. It's not like out there in our public spaces alone. I mean, of course, I, I've written about like how um, the infrastructure of occupation can, you know, kind of shapes our everyday activities in Kashmir in simple things like walking freely. But it's also embedded in our self-consciousness now that um, everything from how we wake up in the morning to how we spend our nights and days is shaped by uh, occupation as a real fact. It is not, when I talk about occupation, I'm not simply talking about legal occupation under international law. I'm talking about occupation with all, all of its materiality, all of the power that it, uh, it has over um, our life. It's power to determine whether we can live uh, or whether we can die. We must die. It's power to determine whether our children can go to school or whether they should just stay home. Uh, it's power to determine, you know, whether how our economy should function, uh, whether, um, you know, there will be transportation today, whether I will be able to go to the, see the doctor today or get medicine today. Every little detail of our lives is shaped by this. Like there is no Kashmiri who does not make everyday decisions, little mundane decisions, um, keeping in view that there is an occupation around. Mm -hmm. that, so that's what um, I, this occupation has does, done to us. Thank you for expanding on that. Um, Basil, last question to you before we get into the questions from the, from the audience. Um, we've talked about the, the kinds of things that military occupation does to Kashmiris. How do Kashmiris resist? Is there a space for resistance? And what are those actual spaces for resistance? Um, and can you, if, those, if there are spaces for resistance, can you expand upon um, what they look like? Are they, is it online activism? Is it street protest? Is it um, the Kashmiri diaspora outside of Kashmir itself? Um, okay. Going back to Aga Shahid Ali again, because I have been reading him a lot. So derived a little inspiration from him. So he went to Barcelona once, and uh, and this is what how the poem starts. Um, so this woman at the airport asks, at the counter asks him, "Are you carrying anything dangerous?" And he says, "Just my heart." So in Kashmir, uh, people who resist the occupation is not just by streets; it's also mental, it's also spiritual as well as as well as it's very in, inherent in in everything you do. Like I was speaking to my mom a couple of weeks ago. She was here a month month back. I asked her, uh, do you walk in, in Kashmir, in Srinagar, where I'm from? Uh, do you walk like you used to in Istanbul? She, I got her like these Nikes after a long time. And she was very really happy about it. So I asked her like, do you walk in your Nikes in Kashmir every day? So it's a very small mundane thing as uh, Jeanette said. So she said, no, I can't walk because the military is everywhere. So the only thing I do is I just go through my videos that I uh, took while I was walking in Istanbul, just uh, reminiscent and talk what could have been with these new Nikes if, I, if everything was fine in Kashmir. So uh, resistance has a lot, there's a lot of spaces in Kashmir. But the thing is that the occupation takes over every damn thing. We do street protests in 2008. We had million man marches before Tahrir happened. We had people organizing protests through social media. The state took over the streets. The state is taking over social media. They're impersonating Kashmiris and trying to say that, okay, these are Kashmiri voices when they are not. And uh, that is that. But also, it's also, when you say you're a Kashmiri, 
uh, with, with, with all that uh, structures of violence, with all the narratives that are being played out by the state and its media. When you say you're a Kashmiri, you're making a political statement because you're denying that India has taken over identity because those who say they are Kashmiris, they don't identify themselves as Indians necessarily. So the resistance is from there. If you say you're a Kashmiri, you resist in, 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 in your existence, first of all. You resist when you, uh, when you wear your, you know, uh, when you wear your ethnic uh, or cultural uh, apparel, when you, uh, when you eat Kashmiri food or when you talk in Kashmiri, because all of these things have gone through us all. When you listen to Kashmiri music, when you go through these poets that have written about Kashmir, when you read history, uh, when you teach Kashmiri kids, when you do these uh, webinar sessions, when you tweet on Twitter, when you post on Facebook, when you make an Instagram story, when you post something on Snapchat about Kashmir. So everything, the state has tried to take over of these Kashmiris. Uh, but, but there's also this resistance that is happening everywhere on all, on all surfaces, because resistance is not just through guns, and it's not just through protests and so on. It's also all these uh, collective resistance that shape our identity. And, and we keep fighting, like if, um, if as long as you say that you're, you're a Kashmiri and you understand the context, you know the history, uh, it's, it's inside you. As I said, when Agar Shahid said that the most dangerous thing about him was his heart. And also the fact that uh, we have been fighting for the last 500 years. This is like a generational struggle that has been going on, like just like the Catalans in, in Spain. And uh, we have our own elements of resistance. Uh, we have been, the slogans that Kashmiris, Kashmiris used uh, when the first o Mughal occupation happened, they are being used against India now. So there's this 500 years of occupation, the same slogans are being used against the different, different types and different dynamics of the occupation. So as long as we exist as Kashmiris, as long as we profess and we, we see ourselves as Kashmiris, we will continue resisting because our ex existence, which the Indian state does not want, is in itself resistance to that. And, you know, we are trying to humanize our own spaces. We're trying to sing, we're trying to write poetry, we're trying to write books, we're trying to get into academia, we're writing stories about you know, all these mundane things, but they're also, for me, a part of an, an external and collective effort to fight an occupation because occupation doesn't just come for your homes and streets. It comes for your mind. It wants to make you, it wants to make occupation a part of your life. It wants to take over all your identity that you have. And when you resist that, through these little things, you are finding an occupation. That is resistance for me as a Christian. Thank you so much for, for expanding on that. Um, I want to, in interest of time as well, um, I want to get to the questions that you all have asked and thank you so much for your patience and we want to make sure that we get to all of your questions. So if you still have them, please type them in, in the next like three minutes. We'll start with the first one, um, which is how does the Indian media play a role in furthering the Islamophobic narrative? How are journalists and newspapers treated when they attempt to center Kashmiri voices? And this is from Alina. Uh, I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, uh, Junie, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Um, well, I mean, I think the in rise of uh, the right wing in India um, wouldn't have been possible if its voice hadn't been amplified by the Indian media so much. I mean, uh, I before starting my research on Kashmir, I actually worked on Indian nationalism itself. Like, and I was curious to ask. Uh, why is it that Indian nationalism simultaneously centers Kashmir while at the same time, like, you know, completely effaces Kashmiri voices? Um, and this was a time when, you know, much of this Hindu nationalist narrative was present in Hindi language media and local media. Um, but over the last, uh, I would say, at least around 10 years, the English language media, the, some of the most sophisticated uh, voices in India have been can, can have adopted the narrative of Hindu nationalism. Uh, you can see them speaking with authority um, uh, over on Kashmir and using their own nationalist framework, which is built on dehumanization of Kashmiris, as Faisal said, dehumanization of Kashmiris, um, 
basically denying them uh, fundamental humanity, uh, use, seeing their voices as uh, necessarily anti-Indian, you know, um, to seek independence or freedom is not to be anti-Indian. You know, one could even argue that uh, Kashmiris might be um, like using the framework of India's own freedom struggle from co uh, its colonial powers uh, to argue against the current Indian imperial aggressions in Kashmir. Um, so in the Indian media has kind of adopted the Hindu right wing narrative uh, hook, line and sinker. And um, this has had, of course, dramatic uh, consequences for Kashmir because for the first time, uh, what I'm seeing is that uh, the Indian society in general, not only those who are trained in RSS shakhas, who are ideologically trained to see Muslims as enemies, but also like young liberal Indians who go to colleges in Delhi, you know, where they are taught uh, liberalism, um, how they have developed this apathetic uh, attitude towards Kashmiris. They are, uh, they would much rather deny that it is happening. They would much rather not see. They would try to unsee all of this. And even if they are forced to talk about it, they would tell us, they, and this is what they do. They tell us, why don't you accept the reality of the India, of its occupation? And uh, why are you even struggling? Like fundamental questions that are not, um, that they wouldn't ask themselves if they were in a position as we are in. So there is, a, I would say there is a definite um, hard wiring of the Indian consciousness that has happened through a lot of ideological training and through a lot of, uh, you know, the work that media has done in amplifying this uh, um, the Hindu agenda. Thank you so much. I think this is a, the, the next question is a really good follow up to this. Um, and it comes from John. Um, so Faisal, this is to you. Most NRI Indians are in support of the occupation most Indians too are in support. Dehumanization has been normalized. Can you comment on how important it is for other social justice movements to be aware of, to be aware of this? For most of the world, India is yoga and Bollywood. For most of Indians, Kashmir is Kashmir ki kali and uh, fair skin beauties and handsome guys. And you know, we have to come there. Article three, there was a song that they, Actually, there were albums out on the same day when this Article 370 was revoked, which basically said Article 370 has been taken. You'll go to Kashmir and find ourselves a Kashmiri wife. I mean, this is the whole film thing that have conditioned Indians to see Kashmir. It's a very new uh, colonial, new colonial oriental lens that Indians have seen Kashmir. And uh, the 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 irony is that uh, most NRI is non-resident Indians who go to the United States and have the best of life and and diversity enjoy the best of diversity have rights to speak whatever they want to they want to uh, silence Kashmiri voices it's it's kind of it's an irony but the thing is that it uh, Modi also generates a lot of power uh, from from his NRI people because he tries to project. Uh, this whole strongman attitude and he says that hindus it's also a fascist mentality where you say you you create this revisionist history where you claim to be these victims from hundreds of years and now it's our time to you know uh, give it back to the muslims because that's the narrative that has been played by the bjp rss basically since 1925 uh, the whole arya arya aryan cultural nationalism and all that things. Uh, Mussolini, incidentally, he had the similar conditional fascism where uh, the attitude was to create this I don't give a damn attitude where these fascists would go down on the streets and beat people up and nobody would care because I don't give a damn was the motto of the fascist. So they had conditioned the society to not give a damn and social media has amplified that because you see, it's not just Kashmir which sees India as an occupation, but it's also Indians who are being, being the brunt of this Hindutva government, who are being lynched and these videos are being disseminated on WhatsApp. First, it's like terrible to see how people are being lynched, but what makes a person take that video in the first place of lynching? It's to, it's to show that whole strongman mentality, like, look, we, are, we will get away with it. We'll show this video 
and so that so those so those videos have normalized violence against India's own marginalized communities, and and Kashmir is like this uh, the center of Hindutva's national project uh, because it's also this. Uh, it was this article in Wire which basically said the Hindu Hindutva fantasy of subjugating Pakistan is being realized by subjugating Kashmiris. So since they, and the way that Indian media has you know called Kashmiris Pakistanis. Uh, you know, and 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 try to dehumanize them and demonize them with the whole journalism of that genocide, basically. In in when that Pulwama attack happened, which um, killed forty plus Indian soldiers in Kashmir, uh, uh, this famous anchor in India, Arnav Goswami, who, if incidentally exists in Rwanda, would have been persecuted for war crimes. He basically said, "I'm okay with collateral damage." In Kashmir, and he has no accountability. So there are these other anchors who like who say like, okay, if his bigotry is getting unchallenged, uh, ours will too. So they try to outdo each other in like who's more bigoted than me. And and our eyes also watch this kind of stuff. Like uh, I recently spoke to an Anara, and I asked her like, why do you support Modi? And her answer was, who, if not Modi, then who else? And this is that whole uh, strongman attitude where you derive power of your ethnicity and and the whole nationalism that is exported to these foreign shores where they enjoy diversity at the same time they want to ghettoize the other minorities. Yes. Uh, coming to that social justice movement, I think it's it's actually very late for uh, social justice movement, and I think now if if not now then never. Again, Aga Shahid Ali says, come before I'm killed, my voice cancelled. So I think it's important for Kashmiris as well as social justice movements to collaborate with each other. Uh, because uh, if like this with, uh, with Stand with Kashmir and you guys, it's very important. And the collaboration should be like on equal, like the Black Lives Matter, we must participate in their social justice movement and they will in turn support ours. Because solidarity is not conditional; it's a two-way street, and it, it has to be like that. And injustice ev anywhere is injustice everywhere. So if you stand up for one marginalized group and one occupied society, you must stand up for everyone. Absolutely, that's the essence of humanity and resistance, basically. Yes, and I I want to just add that um, you know, in in my personal view. Um, that the Indians that are silent in this are are dangerous um, because they are actively promoting violence against Indian. they are actively voting um, promoting um, violence against marginalized populations within India itself within India itself so you know we need to call out every single time a Priyanka Chopra you know tweets Jay Hind we need to call that out 100% um, because that is not okay. We have four questions still left. So I'm gonna just, um, because otherwise we're gonna be here for a good hour and a half. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll probably resolve Kashmir by the end of <laughs> I think One more. Um, so I'm, I wanna just go to uh, Wasim's question, which is why is it that an average Indian person, people is fine with curfew, sheer and just blockage of communication and totally shut down local journalism, is that Islamophobia or are they just fine with it as long as it's not happening to them? We see people reacting to one national language issue more than the issue created by the BJP government. Um, we're seeing that's like three questions in, in one. But um, Junaid, I'm gonna turn that one over to you. Um, sure. Um, so, you know, I have been thinking about how Kashmiris who are just like 8 to 10 million of us and if you count worldwide there are not more than 13 million Kashmiris um, compared to 1.2 billion Indians um, India has used um, this massive kind of differential of population as a weapon against us you know um, I call it using weaponizing noise um, every time a Kashmiri speaks um, there are like hundred Indians who are like ready to offer counter arguments. These are not arguments. These are basically ways to discredit, ways to uh, shut you down, ways to uh, uh, use what about to discredit your suffering and pain, um, ways in which 
you will be silenced and invisibilized. They become hyperactive, for instance, if um, there is any mention of Kashmir in international media or by anyone um, you know, with a recognized voice, voice internationally. Um, it, I think they use noise um, strategically here. Um, and what it does, it, it cultivates an, an attitude which dehumanizes Kashmiris. You know, when you are, when you, there's a single Kashmiri voice and it's being uh, basically uh, silenced by a hundred different Indian voices, of course, there will be no education of, uh, you know, your own community or any global community. If what India has done since 1947 in Kashmir was done by China, not that China is any good, I don't mention, I don't want to say that, but if they had done something like that, um, to uh, people and had prevented international media from raising those questions, um, there would be an uproar. Like, I'm surprised, for instance, that in Hong Kong, there was a first protester who was shot um, by the local police there, and it raised hue and cry uh, across the board. In Kashmir, since 2016, um, there are hundreds of people who've been you know, deliberately blinded, not to mention shot, you know, uh, maimed, uh, you know, disappeared and uh, incarcerated in the most brutal way possible. Yet it does, has not shaken any conscience. I think the reason is, um, of course, one, the entrenched Islamophobia in both international as well as um, Indian journalism, which it, of course, in Indian state uh, benefits from that. And second, that India has used uh, its overwhelming um, you know, voice and amplified voice as a way to shut down Kashmiris, um, you know, denying us violent, uh, a voice. Like uh, one quick example, like if you, I mean, you know, Faisal mentioned these Indian, you know, uh, media personnel who they, whenever they invite Kashmiris, uh, or any Muslim for, for that matter, unless these Muslims are like, you know, support the Indian agenda in Kashmir, um, they are berated, they are uh, disrespected, uh, they're, they're shouted down in, in a way which kind of produces some kind of like a frisson in, uh, among in the Indian audience. They love it when their mm -hmm. anchors are shutting down Kashmiris, that they get some kind of a, a pleasure out of uh, Kashmiri being shown his or her place. So yes, in within that larger ecosystem, I think that uh, of course it is not possible for Kashmiris, Kashmiri voices to be heard and their humanity be to be recognized. Mm -hmm. um, two two more questions, and uh, this one is from uh, someone who is attending anonymously. What are what role are the Ambani's playing in the abolishment of Section three hundred and seventy? Is the Indian business community seeing Kashmir as a place for resource exploitation? Hazel, do you want to take this one? I think Junaid is much better. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I think that, of course, yes. I mean, you have to look at the rise of BJP and the Hindu right wing in um, India is not uh, simply a result of ideological training. It's backed by a lot of corporate money. Um, be it Adani's, be it Ambani's, they have uh, financed many of these corporate news channels that openly propagate the BJP's uh, talking points. Um, I mean, if you look after 19, uh, after the uh, reading down and the abrogation of 3335A, uh, there has been talk about a new corporate conference happening in Srinagar in, in October. It would have happened if like things hadn't gone unexpectedly for India. Um, but they were trying to say, well, we're gonna buy huge tracts of land. And uh, of course, there's a lot of land that is under state control, not just like under in private possession of people, but under state control, which these corporates have been eyeing for a very long time. I mean, look, um, there is, of course, resource extraction that's going to happen. Um, one of the things that the conflict um, was beneficial for was that it protected to some degree um, Kashmiri resources because these corporates were uncertain whether they could invest in, in Kashmir or not. And uh, although they could, they, if they wanted to, they could because they could still have 99 year leases, um, you know, 
which is which are equivalent to actually owning land. Uh, but now what they want is like uh, a settler colonial framework where local populations would be ghettoized, will be put in um, in these uh, spaces that will be kind of uh, ruled in, under a colonial regime, while the rest of the area would be opened up for corporates to buy up, to develop, to uh, creating a secondary population, which will be backed by Indian military and ruled uh, under the same laws as uh, India is. So it's an ecological disaster. So it's not about resource extraction only, it's about the ecological disaster that India is uh, envisioning in Kashmir because Kashmiri ecology is extremely fragile. Like when, when I think about Kashmiris and Kashmir, uh, it's a relationship that goes back millennia. I mean, uh, our ancestors cultivated this land in the most tender way possible, uh, keeping a degree of balance between what the, so the nature had given us and how uh, you know, we used it in a way without destroying it. But of course, the Indian corporates have no such organic links to this region. They're going to use it um, to you know, multiply their profits. Uh, and you know, I mean, of course, that's how capitalism wor works. They, they will turn every last bit of um, you know, leaves and roots and our bones and monetize it. That's what they want to do. Mm. Um, last question to you, uh, This is from uh, Krishi. I'm pretty sure that I am losing touch with reality. I write to keep myself sane. It is day 60 now. It's 12 a.m. where I live, now 12.20. How do we truly help our home? Is there an agenda we should follow? What comes first? Um, again, Aga Shahid Ali. I've been reading him a lot these days. Keeps me sane. Uh, he says uh, in one of his poems, he says, humankind can bear everything. So what we are going through now, an assault on our identity and our existence, we will we will bear it too. I mean, we have been, we are survivors. I mean, that's what we are. We have survived occupations and we have survived crackdowns and, and massacres and killings and murders and, and days without water, days without electricity, snowfall and all those crazy things. But, you know, but we always understand that, you know, we have to continue to live as we want on our own terms. Uh, as a Kashmiri who is outside in a diaspora, it's, it's a very frustrating time. To be honest, I was telling my uh, friends that it, I find rest in a war zone. If I was home, I would, I would be more at rest than being outside where I am so restless. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a thing, I don't know how to say it. In Kashmiri, we say, uh, which is an ancient proverb, which means a sparrow only feels at rest when it's on its own branch, in, in, inside its own nest. So... Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. It's, it's a, there's all, always that much anxiety and restlessness. I mean, we, I talk to my family in my dreams now because I haven't been able to speak with them for like the last two weeks. So I have conversations with them. I'm pretty sure it's for a lot of, lot of us um, because we take a pain uh, more because we feel it, because we have personalized it. Uh, being outside, you can do a lot of things. First of all, you should uh, talk to people, your friends, about how you feel should share your experiences because if you isolate yourself it will only make it worse you need to create a community of your own where you can go and share your pain and anxiety so second you should uh, if you're working you should focus on your profession and in improve your skills because they are, they are going to come in handy someday or even today and if you find any networks of solidarity with black lives matter palestinian societies Indian societies which are for solidarity with Kashmir or any society that works for uh, people or works for any marginalized community, you should participate in them because that will give you a feeling of home. Uh, and, and listen to a lot of Kashmiri music and try to cook Kashmiri food. That's the, that's the best uh, thing you can do to feel better. And also read and write a lot and don't stop writing. Whatever you, you skill you have, uh, using that because that's also a way of resistance. Don't stop fighting. Uh, and there's always this thing we always say, um, bhakti, which means our time will come. So, so we shall wait for that day. Uh, we shall 
uh, we shall meet by the gates of paradise when the soldiers return, uh, when the soldiers disappear and return out of peace. Aga Shaidali to end this. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of you for taking your time. Um, you know, one thing that, that is always interesting about these webinars is that this, this you know, we have Kushi that's in a time zone that is at 12 a.m. You know, I'm in Europe. You two are in different locations. We have people in the States that are joining us. Um, this is an issue that hits many, many people um, in, in different ways. And so I want to thank you both for taking the time to really share your knowledge with us um, and share your presence with us on this webinar. Thank you to every single one of the attendees that are, um, you know, from wherever you have joined us and wherever you are going to be seeing this, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on YouTube, or another medium, thank you so much for taking the time to really um, expand your knowledge in regards to this issue. Silence is not an option. Um, Please make sure that you follow Stand With Kashmir, our really great friends with Stand With Kashmir. They just did an incredible silent vigil in New York um, um, this past weekend. And so definitely check out their website. We'll make sure to put the links in the next newsletter that we send out. Um, and then stay tuned for our next webinar, which happens in two weeks, um, and then two weeks after that. So. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much, Junaid and Faisal, for joining us. And, and Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you, Faisal, too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.